longest living mushroom in the world. It's exclusive to the old growth forest, and as a result now, it's extinct in the UK, is nearly extinct in Europe, except in Slovenia and Austria, and have a band of large trees where it still grows in limited arena. But it grows in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And National Geographic gave me the Green Ovator Award. I still don't know what that means, but it's nice to give them the award for National Geographic. And then they wanted to send a photojournalist to do a story on me. And so they came out in July, and we rented the Misty Isles, this little boat with a Zodiac. And this is in British Columbia, where we had been focused on finding a Garakon because there's so many vir virgin old growth forests there. And so this is the area that we went up in British Columbia. And there's hundreds of islands. You can't see them all. There's lots of islands. So the idea is we'd go along and with binoculars that we'd be able to find these big agaricons. Because they grow in huge Douglas fir trees that have been snapped by storms or hit by lightning. And they're oftentimes bald eagles sitting up in these trees. So they're living snags. And so these living snags that have broken is where our garicon typically grows. So they, he asked me, he's from New York City, he asked me, well, how likely will I find it? I said, oh, you know, 50-50. Well, in truth, it's about one out of a hundred times. But I was doing the math. I had ten friends with binoculars along the shoreline. Yeah, 50-50 sounds reasonable. So he got on the boat with us. We go out on the boat. And we look and we look and we look and we look and we look. Four or five hours pass, and we're dizzy because we're looking at each tree for you know, two seconds, five seconds. Looking, looking, and we can't find any agaricon. This guy flew all the way from New York, you know, National Geographic guy, and we're going, uh oh. And he goes, This is not going, going too well, is it? You know, and I'm going, That's like fishing, be patient, you know, it's okay. And, and, uh, and then we got really tired, and so the skipper said, Could you want to go look at some First Peoples, some Native American pictographs? I said, A really beautiful pictograph site, not, not far from here. So we went to this pictograph site. You can barely see the pictograph there. It's the closer one. This overhangs about 30 feet. And this used to red, one run red with, uh, with sand. And uh, so to have an overhang where it was easy to fish would be a very good place for first peoples to hang out. Good place for a pictograph. So we motored over there, you know, now looking for pictographs. We get over there and lo and behold, we find a caracon all around this shamanic site. So, wow, that's interesting. And that's the agaricon that we found. It actually fell from a branch, fell through the air, landed on this branch, teeter-tottered, the mycelium grew back into the tree, and then it grew two legs. <laughs> no wonder it's called Elixirium ad, 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 ad mom vitamin. This thing does not know, I mean, it keeps on growing. And so, we were totally excited, and then we looked around, and I found more agaricon, and then I began to wonder, well, that's just very interesting. And agaricon has been described by Dioscorides as a treatment against respiratory illnesses. Consumption, later thought to be known as tuberculosis, one of the consumption diseases. And so, Scott Franswell, the director of the Institute for Tuberculosis Research from the University of Chicago, is very much into ethnobotany and the use of medicinal herbs in Europe and the New World for fighting tuberculosis. And tuberculosis kills more, besides HIV, than any other contagion out there currently. So this is one of the pictographs, and there's Dr. Scott Francois. So he went with us, and we looked at these pictographs, and we were excited that we found the agaricon. And the agaricon, over the, the thousands of years, had the Venus of Willendorf forms. And so here's the Venus of Willendorf form that looks like the backside of a lady. Uh, and so through the doctrine of signatures, as all of you know here, you know, when the form resembles the organ that needs to be treated. And so this was primarily a woman's medicinal mushroom. And so it goes chalk white. It's been called the quinine fungus. It doesn't contain quinine. But you break much of the piece of this mushroom off, you put it on your tongue, you chew it up, and you breathe in, and it opens up the airways. It has a very strong you know, um, effect on the respiratory system. And the Haida Indians of the, of the Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands, uh, carved a garicon in these figurines and placed them on the graves of shamans. Now, for a hundred years, these were in the museums, and they thought to be carved of wood until Nancy Turner, Robert Blanchett, and another mycologist analyzed these and found out they were made of agaricon. So the Haida Indians and the North Coast Indian, uh, Native Americans knew that agaricon was spiritually significant. And so we go back to this rock. So this is one of the North Coast Indians that used agaricon. There's agaricon all around. And so I hypothesized, well, the agaricon was here first. 
it grows for thousands of years in the trees endophytically. It grows as an endophyte, helping the trees against disease. And then there's, they made these pictographs, and then we're looking at this, and, and uh, we brought the film crew, and, and I'm looking at this rock. Well, wait a second. What's that rock doing there? I spoke to several geologists. They said this rock is a total anomaly. So you look at the rock, there's a Garakon. You look at the rock, there's a Garakon. Look at the rock. You get my picture here? So I was like, wait a second, this rock may be carved. So what's the probability that we find a Garakon? Well, it's really about 100 to 1. What's the probability we find a Garakon, a pictographic site, that Native Americans would find shamanistically powerful and spiritual? I don't know, 10,000 to 1. What's the probability we'd have, find it with a rock that looks like a carved like a Garakon? I don't know, a million to 1. And then what's the probability we'd find it on my birthday? <laughs> At this point, the the National the National Ge Geographic writer is, is pretty much stunned, you know? And he turns to, to, to several of my friends and he goes, does this happen to Paul often? And my friend said, yes. <laughs> this is vision quest. This is what it's all about. With purity of heart, purity of intention, risk taking, not being clear exactly about where you're going, but know that you must go forward, then nature rewards you. And that is truly is what has happened in my life. So here is the, the, one of the largest agaricons that we found. And uh, this one is uh, um, one that we found to be extremely active against a number of, of diseases, which we'll hear more about. That's an old growth tree that I was growing upon. And that's how big it is. It. So you get an idea how big that tree is. So this is my weird brother, Bill. He's a city boy from Chicago. Still didn't have a driver's license. I won't go there. Um, and he is fascinated, and he goes into the woods with us. And after three days in the woods, he's totally silent. And we're in these huge trees. That's a 700-year-old Douglas fir. And my brother Bill is very understated, and he's an ultra-skeptic about everything. And I asked my brother Bill, well, what do you think, Bill? And he says, good. I said, Bill, what do you think? Good. <laughs> he basically was speechless. It was so good, he had no words other than good. So, anyhow, so here's the biggest agaricon we've ever seen in our lives. And this is on Cortez Island, British Columbia. And so, a friend of mine is a tree climber. And he ascended into the canopy. And there he goes. And there is this agaricon, which is probably 100 years old. Now that's more than 100 mile an hour winds. 300 inches of rain per year, under severe conditions of ice storms, you know, rain and brilliant sun, and it survives longer than any other mushroom in the world. It's figured out a host defense of resistance against disease that we might learn from. So this is why I'm particularly interested in this, in this, this specimen. So there it is in all of its glory. It looks like a big bee's nest from a distance. And uh, those are annual growth rings, or actually probably decades in some cases. So we don't want to take the mushroom down because it's rare. So we go up and we take these little stainless steel probes, cork borers. We take a small piece of tissue, that's all that we need. So we're able to get this fungus into culture, which is extremely important because we're losing the habitats for these ecosystems and this species is in rapid, rapid decline. And the mycologists have identified the species as on the red list of near extinction in Europe. So it is extremely rare if you find Alan, if you see anything like this in your old trees, you know, let me know. So, this is the, what else, also is very bizarre. We go to this mushroom conference in Oregon at Brighton Bush Hot Springs. 150 mycologists there. I hold up a Garakon and I said, at the beginning of this conference, we need to collect strains of this fungus. If you find it, don't pick it. Take photographs. Show us where it is. We'll do a small tissue sample. Leave it there. It's essential for our research. I make an announcement on Thursday night, and on Friday we do the first foray. Two forays on Friday, two forays on Saturday, two forays on Sunday. 150 people times six, 900 ventures into the old growth forest. No one has found a garicon. My wife and I are driving back from the conference, and my wife looks over and goes, those look like great woods. I go, sounds good to me. So put on the brakes, and we get out of the car. And this is what happened. October 27, 2008, we just started leaving Brighton Bush Hot Springs and saw a beautiful old growth forest. And we came in here 
And then we saw a blue tag basically saying that this entire forest is going to be cut. So we're 200 feet away from the road, beautiful old growth forest, and we're hiking in here and we find uh, an old friend. And this is Bumby Thompson's Fishnalis, Agaricon, otherwise known as a quinine fungus. This area is going to be totally destroyed here in the next year. This is a perfect opportunity for us to get a, another strain in the culture. This one's probably about 40 or 50 years old. It's still alive at the bottom here. Uh, we would normally just take a small piece of tissue uh, and about the size of my fingernail and take it back to the laboratory. But in this case, the loggers are going to totally destroy the situation uh, here, so we may as well harvest it. Harvesting this is easier said than done, or maybe not. Look at this, it's giving itself up. Look how easy that is. Whoa. Whoa. It just gave itself up. And, um, and so it's this tissue here that we'll get the culture from. That was sweet. <laughs> So that's our 14th strain of agaricon and culture. We currently have 37 strains, largest culture library in the world. We match the strains up to make sure that they are indeed different. This is a challenge test. They form those ridges there. They are indeed different strains. If they were the same strain, they would grow together seamlessly. So this became critically important after 9-11. I submitted 600 strains to date to the BioShield program of the U.S. Defense Department. The U.S. Defense Department got a hold of me because the biggest concern that they had after 9-11 was bioterrorism. After 1968, none of us have been immunized against smallpox, so the majority of individuals in this audience are you're totally susceptible to a smallpox should there be a pandemic. So Dr. Earl Kern is a smallpox expert with the U.S. government BioShield program. This is a selectivity index <coughs> number. Strains of agaricon, any strain that has two or more is active, 10 or greater is considered to be very active. And here we have three strains and Piptoporus betulanus, the birch polypore, which you have here turned out to be also active against smallpox, orthopoxes to be precise. We also, this is vaccinia and, and cowpox that was tested. It was also tested against variola, which is smallpox, which the U.S. government and the Russians and a number of other governments have. It is believed by the U.S. and British intelligence agencies that Al-Qaeda purchased uh, smallpox from uh, the broken republics of Russia you know, in the 1990s. Um, so, we, the uh, pandemic is extremely uh, important that we consider the possibilities. I spoke to Al Gore about this in particular. As some of you may or may not know, the Center for Disease Control in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, sent uh, a, a group of scientists up into the Arctic and they captured the 1918 H1N1 flu virus from uh, cadavers, dead sailors who died from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. They brought it back and got it into the culture. Well, more, uh, you could do that also with smallpox. There are smallpox sailors that are frozen in the Arctic with global warming. They can thaw. Mice can they have mousepox. We can get mousepox. We can get monkeypox. It's one arm's length of transmission, typically. But the mousepox, then the mice could do then uh, we release smallpox into the human population. So we are in, in a stage of viral storms. We're going to see these increasingly as habitats are eroded. And as we lose biodiversity, it's like losing... Um, uh, uh, rivets in an airplane, at what point we lose so much biodiversity the ecosystem will unravel. So we made some press on this, and I actually came out with a statement, and it was vetted by the U.S. government, and it was on National Public Radio, uh, making the case that we should save the old growth forest as a matter of national defense. That actually went over very, very well with the U.S. government. But then we had the H5N1 scare and the H1N1 scare, so we went ahead and decided to try our natural extracts. This is just mycelium. And we tried the mushrooms too, but my cellular works better, uh, in water with ethanol. And here's the selectivity index, remember? Two or more is active, ten or more is greater. We tried it against flu B viruses, we're in the 300s. Compared to the ribavirin control, which is a pure pharmaceutical, our natural extract, the witch's brew, you could call it, was far more active than the pure pharmaceutical standard against which it was tested. We tried it against H3N2, and then flu B viruses, and then we tried it against H5N1 and our selectivity was off the chart, greater than a thousand. We will have viral pandemics in the future. We will have viral storms as often as we have weather systems changing now as the ecosystems are eroded. And finding new compounds that can fight viruses is critically important. In the past three weeks, we have identified now with the U.S. government, who I'm very thankful and grateful to, I want to acknowledge that the U.S. Defense Department has funded my research now to more than $600,000. Haven't given me any money, but they've given me all this laboratory time, and we have now just isolated out of the Garicon a constellation, a family of new antiviral agents heretofore undiscovered. 
um, isolated from agaricon. So we have had the made the medical breakthrough. The fact that agaricon is also dually active against bacteria is really important. Many of you probably know that most people who die from viruses die from bacterial pneumonia, where the virus scars the lungs and the bacteria grow. And so the rest of the death for, is from bacterial pneumonia, even though you have a viral infection. So the viruses knock down your host defensive immunity, and the bacteria then go crazy, and the bacteria typically kill you. So to find something that's dually active against viruses and bacteria within one natural species, occurring species in the endangered ecosystem, I think is a national and international priority. Viruses don't care about borders. We shouldn't either. Um, so this is something that's critically important, and um, this is something we spend an enormous amount of time. So what other mushrooms that we grow, and um, I need about 20 more minutes here to finish. And this is the reishi mushroom, which is uh, Ganoderma lucidum. This is my best buddy, Dr. Andrew Weil. He's a well-known Harvard physician and a strong advocate of the use of medicinal mushrooms. And this is one of the most beautiful mushrooms that we grow. And then, uh, they produce these wood conchs. Um, they're very tough. You have to make tea out of them. But as the mycelium produces the mushroom, uh, there's all sorts of unique molecules that are being assembled, and this, that, that assembly molecules is what we're focusing on, because they have very, very powerful immune benefiting effects. This is a simple chart, and I'll just summarize it saying a seven species blend of seven different polypore mushrooms have a better uh, response to your natural killer cell than any one species of the same dose by itself. Again, using a consortium, using a guild, using a plurality of species together gives you a better immune benefit than one by itself. So the turkey tail mushrooms is what you have here, and we've been funded by the National Institute of Health for a $2.2 million breast cancer clinical study at the University of Minnesota Medical School and the Steer Medical School. It's in its third year of completion. Uh, it'll be published this next year. Uh, they use specifically our mushrooms, and we looked at boiling the mushrooms in hot water versus the mycelium. So it's a three-arm uh, clinical study with ladies that's between stage 2 and stage 3 breast cancer. And the turkey tail mushrooms we grew up in our, in our laboratory. Now, this, is, this struck me very intensely and personally at home. Now, um, in June of 2009, my mother, who's a charismatic Christian, called me up. And she said, Paul, I have, I have something to tell you that very much worries me. But you're always so busy, Paul. And I go, oh, that's a terrible thing for a son to hear. And I said, what's wrong? And she goes, my right breast is five times the size of my left. I have six angry lymph nodes the size of walnuts that are swollen on my right side. I think I should go see a doctor. And I said, I started crying on the phone. She hadn't been to see a doctor since 1968. She thought faith would heal her. So I spent most of June in breast cancer clinics. This is in Seattle, Washington, the Seattle Breast Cancer Clinic. The oncologist lady there told me it's the second worst uh, case of breast cancer she's ever seen in 20 years. We went through MRIs and metastasized to her liver and metastasized to her sternum. Her tumor was 5.5 centimeters in diameter. You can imagine that. And, and it was in her bloodstream. So there was many loci where the tumors were, were beginning to proliferate. She was too old to have chemo, to, to have surgery, being 84 years of age. And she, uh, um, she uh, could not have radiation therapy. So the doctor took me off to the side, and of course everyone, you know, the, you know, the, being the children, and she appointed me to be in far charge of her affairs. She, I said, how, how much time? Tell me how much time. She said, three months. My mother went out and bought a pine box, and she bought a casket. And, uh, sorry. So we, and, and then the doctor said, you know, there's an interesting breast cancer clinical study going on uh, as an adjunct, where they're using these medicinal mushrooms that can help your immune system. And, then my mother realized that I was the one that's supplying the breast cancer clinical study. And, and she goes, my son's supplying those. And the doctor said, well, you know, I recommend you take them. You know, she's had, you know, three months to live. So she was put on her septin, and then she started taking these uh, turkey tail, uh, these turkey tail mushrooms in the capsules um, twice a day, uh, four capsules a day. And then as of January 1st this year, she's tumor free. So I got her back. <laughs> so this is not our, our turkey tail. It can be the turkey tails you got on the woods to, uh, out here. So anyone who's faced with uh, a, a, a solid tumor uh, phenomenon in, in an oncology is known as solid tumors. 
These turkey tail racket fungi that grow on the trees around here are really helpful. I think you should have a medicinal mushroom garden uh, at Findhorn. I'd love to help you set that up. So this is a, we did we compared it to something called PSK, which is well known in, in Asia uh, for having an effect uh, in helping the immune system. And uh, PSK um, helped this ex vivo blood from the researchers that put into petri dishes and they gave it this turkey tail extract of a purified compound. It, it increased immune function by 15%, and our mycelium and our fruit bodies increased by 22%. Again, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You can fractionate into inactivity, and this is what I'm hammering to these scientists that want the magic bullet. You can fractionate all you want, but you can fractionate down to elemental compounds. You know, carbon and hydrogen, then what do you have, you know? So, you know, you have to stop at the stage where you have the best immune benefit, and complexity in nature is a rule, not simplicity. So, then at Fred Hutch Cancer Center, a, a physician called me up, a dual MD, PhD. He's the Merkel cell carcinoma expert in the world. Merkel cell carcinoma is a form of, like, melanoma, except it's far more aggressive, far more deadly. Kills patients within about three or four months. It metastasizes very quickly. And these are two, and so now we have, we, in, and they reset, they cut on week one, they see the patients at week six. They have no chemotherapy, radiation therapy, uh, this is the immune mitigated disease. So all they can do is cut, cut, cut. And the slides that I saw were just, you know, for an amateur like me, who are horrific. I mean, they, they pockmark the entire body, and at some point they say, they, there's no more lymph nodes to remove, <laughs> we can't do anything for you, and the patients die. And so, but they had uh, several patients who had phenomenal spontaneous recoveries. And, uh, and after three years, after three years in their cancer, it's considered to be 95% probability you are cured. And so they brought back these patients and they said, we have to analyze, what did you do? We didn't do anything. We can't do anything for this, this disease. It's, it's caused by viral proteins, a new virus called polyoma, that all of us have when we're about six to 10 years of age. But your genetic makeup of these, these viral proteins cause this cancer to grow. And, um, and so this is what, this is immune evasion. And your natural killer cells try to find binding sites into the stroma of the cancer. This is a cancer. And the natural killer cell, the immune system, can't penetrate this skin. But when they have immune invasion, not evasion, the natural killer cells, which are all these little dots, go into the cancer cells and then they, they find a way of finding a binding site as an entry portal to scavenge away the cancer. So this is the patients that survived after three years, all had their cancer was scavenged away it's about four to six months into their therapy, and the patients don't want to tell the doctors what alternative medicines they're taking because they don't want, to, don't want to be made fun of. And so these patients all said they were taking Paul and Dusty's medicinal mushrooms. So Fred Hutch Cancer Center called us up. We went up, up to Seattle, one of 15 oncologists and five, uh, five other researchers. Three other doctors were up the learning curve. They made the case for us. And we think what these medicinal mushrooms do is allow your immune system to find binding sites to go into the cancer cells. That's why it's active against breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and uh, melanoma, as well as Merkel cell carcinoma. So we think this opens a much larger picture, a much larger landscape, that the immunotherapy from these medicinal mushrooms, primarily woodcocks growing on the trees, you know, talk to Alan, he's a resident polypore expert, these things are extremely immune benefiting. So, and Chaga, and um, Daniel, what do you think? Should I go, go, or should I cut it short? What do, you, do people want to hear another 15 minutes? Or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Don't ask me. <laughs> this is Chaga, in um, Notice Oblicus. Uh, I don't know if you have Chaga here. I think you should. Um, I wrote it yesterday. Oh, you did? Okay, good. Excellent. Well, it's an extremely potent um, um, mushroom, which is extremely tough. And, um, and much has been written up on it. And the shiitake mushrooms that we grow. And then we grow shiitake mushrooms. I did this experiment. Shiitake mushrooms have lots of, of ergosterol. And ergosterol, uh, when you put, uh, the, the, we analyze the mushrooms for vitamin D, there's only 15 to 134 IUs of vitamin D uh, in, uh, per 100 grams per high weight. Now you need between 600 to 1,000 IUs of vitamin D per day for your immune system. It's extremely important. I think you all know that. And we're vitamin D deficient, being in the northern latitudes. And so these are shiitake mushrooms that we grow indoors and we dry them indoors. And then we, this is Cynthia, 
and, uh, and we took the shiitake mushrooms out, we sliced them, and we also put the mushrooms gills up in the sun for two days in the summer. And the vitamin D soared from 15 to 134 to more than 46,000. Day three, the UV started to break down the, the vitamin D. This is pro-vitamin D2. Pro-vitamin D3 typically is manufactured on, through skin exposure. Those of you who are drinking fortified milk may not know that most of the vitamin D3 you're getting in fortified milk is coming from hog skins from Ireland that are on UV conveyor belts that they generate the vitamin D in that fashion. But pro-vitamin D2 is, you know, sort of a, is a non-meat source of, 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 vitamin, of vitamin D. And so we found then, we did experiments that you could collect, you know, wild mushrooms. Try them, like right now, try them. And next summer, mark it on your calendar, between June 15th and July 15th, take them outside, dried mushrooms, put them out in the sun, from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, cover them with cardboard so you don't get dew you know, on the mushrooms, or bring them back inside, put them out again the next day, and in two days, the vitamin D in the mushroom soars. The vitamin D then, the mushroom you put back into a jar, you know, kept in cold storage, the vitamin D is fairly stable for several years. You can generate all your own vitamin D from wild or cultivated mushrooms by putting them out in the sunlight, you know, at, at, uh, at, at, the, peak, uh, at the peak of the sun uh, weeks. So very important that you know that. So I'm going to, you know, have parasol mushrooms here. I'm so glad you have so many of those eight mushrooms that we have. We're in love with parasols. This is a thatch ant mound, you know, around, around Douglas fir trees. This is the genus Atta, the big Atta genus. And there's a parasol mushroom, which I saw several today and several yesterday. Now, ants are experienced fungus farmers. This is a real good test for your students. So, this is a real good one for you to memorize. There are four animals on this planet that cultivate fungi. Can you name them? Cultivate fungi. Four animals. People. Ants. I'm giving you a hint here. Termites. And bark beetles. Those are the four animals known so far to cultivate Fungi. Good experiment. So ants figured out how to cultivate uh, a f fungi about 50 million to 25 million years ago. They started cultivating fungi. And they did so because the mycelium would honeycomb the nest, produce antibiotics that gave a host defensive resistance against bacterial parasites. So they figured this out 25 million years ago. We're just figuring it out today. <laughs> Who's more advanced? Um, so I... I grew up the parasol mushroom mycelium in the laboratory and we went to an ant mound and Dusty's very trusting and I said, Dusty, we're going to do an experiment. You take the shovel and you break down the ant mound and I'll be the photographer. <laughs> she goes, well, what's going to happen? I go, well, the ants are going to attack you. And they're going to go up that shovel and really get angry. But we can do this really fast. You know, she's so trusting. And so we, we had a third person there. So we, put, we tore down the ant hill and we threw the mycelium on top that you see here. And a few hours later, the mycelium was all incorporated into the nest. The ants immediately charged up the shovel. As soon as we made contact with the mycelium, within 30 to 45 seconds, the ants reversed themselves. Reversed themselves, going up the, up the shovel, went back to the mycelium, and then it constructed the nest out of the mycelium that we introduced. They called off their attack. They recognized the mycelium as a beneficial fungus. And so the next year, boing, we had big parasol mushrooms come up, just a few of them, but then the ant colonies started splitting up, as they do, and we had spore cast. And then next year, we had more parasol mushrooms coming up, edible in choice, and the stem buds regrow. Take your stem buds from your parasol mushrooms, you can plant them like bulbs, or you can carve them, break them up, and put them in the corrugated cardboard, grow lots of them, plant them elsewhere. And so then we then started growing more parasol mushrooms, and this shows you how quickly they grow. It is one, it is a, one day, the next day, the next day, and then I have a beer reading her times. <laughs> and so, the parasol mushrooms also are very advantageous because the ants are territorial. So in the United States, we have a huge problem with termites and carpenter ants, because our houses are made primarily of wood. Uh, my understanding here is you don't have that issue because your houses typically are not of wood, except for here at Finhorn. But it's a huge, multi-billion dollar industry causing billions of dollars worth of damage to the infrastructure. The Super Collider is built in Switzerland. You know why it's not built in Texas? Because of fire ants. Fire ants are attracted to the electromagnetic forces of the wires, 
and they kept on eating the cables in Texas. They couldn't get rid of the ants. The cost overruns were so large, the U.S. government bailed out, wouldn't support it. So little ants can cause huge problems. So some of these mushrooms become really, really large. This is my grandson, Trevon. Look at the size of that stone bug. You know, this is enough for a family of four. And then we started growing more of them, and then we had hundreds of them coming up. So now we have between 200 and 400 parasol mushrooms coming up around our property. And then all the employees here would take stem butts, and they went to thatch ant mounds and plugged the thatch ant mounds, or, or just threw them in their gardens and stuff. And so we have parasol mushrooms now emanating, you know, out of this epicenter of, of where we live, you know, across the landscapes of western Washington. This is a ton of fun. Um, so another mushroom is termitomyces. This is a termite mush mushroom, and after the termite mound is abandoned, the mushrooms form. But prior to that time, the honeycomb prevents diseases. Again, a fungal defense against pathogens, other bacteria, and other fungi. So my house is being gobbled up by carpenter ants, and Andy Wild described it as the worst house he's ever been in in the United States. And at a flat roof, we had 12 buckets catching rainwater. And when the wind would blow, it would blow through our house because the door frames were no longer square. And as you know, it's square, and, you know, so and you can imagine. So Dusty moved up from California, and I was really afraid that she was going to leave me because our house was in such bad condition. And um, and but my mother taught me well. Every morning, I would vacuum our house ever since I was seven years old. And so here I am in my you know in my fifties, and I'm vacuuming my house every morning, picking up the sawdust pile. I was collecting in a corner of my house every morning. There was a big sawdust pile from the carpenter ants that consumed the wood the night before. So my ritual was drinking coffee, vacuuming. You know, day one, drinking coffee, vacuuming. Day two, 1,200, 1,400 days later, drinking coffee, vacuuming. You begin to start thinking about things. Like, you know, my house is being destroyed. 1,400 days later, I'm doing the same thing. I like the coffee and I like the vacuum, but this is getting ridiculous. You know. So I went to the environmental protection homepage and I found this fungus that's called metarhizium. It's an entomopathogenic fungus. It's a fungus that kills insects. Every insect in the world is attacked by a fungus. And the insects have developed defenses against these fungi. So the entomopathogenic fungi that kills insects, the insects avoid those fungi and the spores. And it's like penicillium molds. So I got these fungi, I was horrified they had mold spores because I don't want mold spores in my laboratory. But then I thought, saw this. Four of these Leo culture dishes form a white wedge. So I looked up in the scientific literature and said, what's this white wedge all about? They said, it's senescence. This culture's going bad. It's, no, it's, it's not, no longer able to reproduce. Avoid sectors. Everybody said that. I thought, well, everyone's avoiding sectors. I think I'll chase this mycelium, and maybe I can delay sporulation. Sure enough, I did. I went from this stage to that stage in about eight weeks. Now, the biggest problem with using these fungi for preventing termites and fire ants and carpenter ants, they also are using other bull weevils, etc., etc., also the insects. The insects can smell this fungus from way far away and they avoid it. So, when termite bait stations were made, put around houses in the United States, Canada, and elsewhere around the world, the ants and the termites won't go near them because they smell the spores, they avoid the spores, they didn't know it's the plague, so they avoid them. So, I morphed the strain into a pre sporulating stage. And there's the place I would vacuum every morning. There's my Douglas fir needles, you know, you can see how eroded this is. And, and I grew up in mycelium, put on about 100 kernels of rice, and I made a big theater to my wife and my daughter, and saying, We're going to trick the carpenter ants. Put this out at 9 o'clock at night. And fortunately, my daughter has not only saved my life once on a river trip, but she's helped me a lot in my inventions. At midnight, she had to use the bathroom. And she went out of her way to look at this little Barbie doll dish that I got from her Barbie doll set. And she looked down and she couldn't believe what she saw. She said, Dad, Dusty, wake up. And we went there and they were swarming with carpenter ants. And we couldn't believe it. Now, if she didn't wake us up, mice, I had mice in the house, the mice could have eaten the rice, you know, all the other But we saw this. We actually witnessed this. And so sure enough, I, I came up with a new way of treating ants and carpenter ants where the mycelium is not repulsive. The ants will actually aggressively attack it and they take the mycelium back to the queen. Now these are factory fortresses, and the ants, the guards at the entrance of the, of the nest, are trying to prevent any worker that has any spore of this fungus. If a worker comes back and tries to get back in the nest, they protect the queen at all costs, the guards capture that worker, take it down to a graveyard, cut off its head, 
and then both of the, uh, the guards die. And every termite nest, and every carpenter nest, and every ant nest in the world has a graveyard. And in this graveyard is this fungus. This is the most common fungus in nature. And so every one of those colonies, anywhere in the world, has this fungus growing in it. And so the graveyards, you know, are populated with these fungi. And the workers come back, and the spores stick to the workers, and they want to protect the queen. So, we were able to get the ants to be attracted to the mycelium. We saw the ants carry the mycelium back into the nest. And then the ants become mummified. And then they die. And they give them dirty, they give them, I've never done opium den, den, but I imagine it's like they're not cleaning themselves very well. And so they get lazy at that hygiene, and then this fungus that attacks them. And then, boom, it kills the fungus, the, the, it kills the insect, and then the insect sporulates. Now this is not a sick house syndrome insect. So having the insect, so you can breathe the spores, it's not harmful to you, it's not harmful to honeybees, fortunately. But it's, it's target specific to many of the pest insects that uh, plague us, that are chemical pesticides are being used. The alternative for this that right now is being used is the incredibly toxic pesticides that hit harm non-targeted insects, that pollute the water tables, pollute the fish, you know, you know the story. Is largely based on the petrochemical industry. So then the ants sporulate and they die in your house and the repellency property keeps them away from your house for years. So 25 cents, I can protect the house for 10 years or more using a natural fungus that grows in the graveyard of any of these colonies that I can find anywhere in the world. So my Aunt Louise discovered that I had a treatment against carpenter ants and we have an old family house on the water outside of Seattle, Washington. And she calls me up and says, Oh, Paul, she's like 87 years of age. We, we have a problem with carpenter ants. And I know you don't like chemical pesticides, but I'm going to use them. I go, Aunt Louise, please don't. Let me try this. So I went up there and looked for a little sawdust pile coming out of the house. I found entry point. And then I did the same thing that you saw. But fortunately, my Aunt Louise left me a recording. And I can't believe I have this recording. So here is my Aunt Louise talking about her ants. And she's very good at observation. So here's, here's what she says. What are the wings calling? And you, on Wednesday, I'm very excited to tell you that the ants are all gone. I came down Sunday morning, and on the rest below the toilet was a huge circle of black ants, and they were all acting very strange, and they weren't running anywhere. And among the ants was a very large black ant that I figured must have been the queen. So I thought, what do I do? So I picked the carpet up and shook all those ants into the toilet and flushed it. And now they're gone. And I've only seen one other ant that was incapacitated and he was kind of going crazy trying to walk out on the front porch. So I stepped on him and finished him. But I have not seen any ants anywhere out on this next deck. So, I saved my aunt's house. She did use chemical pesticides. How did she use chemical pesticides? It would hurt the fish. This is totally localized. This is important that everybody understands this. This is not spread, spread, spread to play. This is a natural fungus unique to every one of these ant colonies. I just change it into a mycelial form, and then I protect the house. Um, in my books, I have these very strong ethical environmental standards, uh, guiding principles. And my number one guiding, guiding principles, we had wage no war against insects. I just don't want to have termites or carpenter ants in my house. You can have the rest of nature. So I'm very careful about this technology, and the amazing thing happens is that these insects then, boing, pop a cordyceps mushroom. It turns out this fungus is dimorphic, and the, and the tro tropics, these, these fungi, cause the insects to climb to the top of the canopy of the forest. They lock their mandibles into a leaf and then boing, a mushroom, a cordyceps comes out of their head. And then it sporulates and the spores can fly free and far. So this dialectical dance between dinner and death, between uh, insects and fungi, has been going on for hundreds of millions of years. And I've been playing around with this for a long time. My house came down, I received my first patent, um, uh, which I'm going to race against the pesticide industry because of their nasty characters. And so this is called an Alexander Graham Bell patent. It's a blocking patent, um, and it's using a totally nature-based system. The first patent was against, uh, approved against uh, carpenter ants, fire ants, and termites. 
we tried extracts and four choices here with termites. They preferentially go to the extracts of the mycelium and they don't go to the, the other preferred uh, other choices that would otherwise be preferred. I received my second patent against all social insects. I proved it was wor it worked against eight insects. This is the patent office then caused of obviousness and they gave me all uh, 200,000 species. The Australian then I tried it against mosquitoes and fungus gnats. It works against them as well. The Australian uh, patent office gave me all insects and all entomopathogenic fungi prior to sporulation. It doesn't get any bigger than that. The patents have been evaluated, evaluated between 20 and 40 billion dollars worldwide if they could be put into practice. I met with every major pesticide company that you all know them. There's only one company I refused to work with, that's Monsanto. Um, the other companies that they did their own experiments, and it's just a classic story of greenwashing. They want to greenwash and tell their stockholders they're investing in green technologies, but their petrochemical factories have turned up billion dollars worth of profits. And I was told by several of the pesticide leaders that this is terrible. They've had to lay off their employees. This works too well. 25 cents per house. You know, they make their money on service. Um, the fact their product doesn't work that well, and so you have to keep on going back to them to have them do it again and again. So I've been in, you know, it's a very bizarre and long story. My life has been threatened several times. I've had uh, two people try to kill me in the past 10 years, uh, specifically, I think, related to this. I'm making no exaggeration. I don't normally say this in public. I don't want to be dramatic about it, but um, it's something that I don't know what's going to happen with these patents. It'll take me over $10 million to commercialize them. The purpose of patents is to reward the inventor and then reward society after 17 years. But if I can't get this patent up, up and running, then you know, it's going to be given away to the world anyhow. Anyone can practice the patent. You know, I'm giving you permission to do so for non-commercial purposes. The patent and the method for doing this is fully described and I fully disclose in how to produce it. So I'm going to end up on something that I am really excited about, is uh, my life box. It's taken me 10 years to produce this, and this is my way of regreening the planet. And inside the corrugations of this box are 10 tree seeds, 10 species of tree seeds, and mycorrhizal fungi. And upon germination, they're all unified together by mycelium. So you can take a DVD, you can put soil on it, and inside the corrugations are the seeds and the spores of the beneficial fungi. You add water to it, and you can take a box that has boots in it. You can add water to it. And there's my grandson growing a little miniature all-growth forest. And there's uh, beaches and birches and cedars and hemlocks and, uh, and fir trees and pine trees in here. And so the first two years, all you need is the space of a one laptop computer. A little mini forest comes up. And I had redwood sequoias in here. And I told my grandson that a little, little, little seed could grow a tree 200 feet tall. I think he was really amazed. And um, then the, the trees come up. And then after a year or two, you have to separate them 33 feet apart. Now, here's the numbers. The nature is a numbers game, so I like these numbers. A 1% share of cardboard in the United States is 25,000 acres per week. That's how much is consumed in the United States. 1% share of cardboard, 25,000 acres per week. When you have these uh, trees, you have to spread them out 33 feet apart. So a square foot goes out to 33 feet by 33 feet is 1,000 square feet. So it's 1,000x multiple. So 25,000 acres per week goes to 25 million acres per week if we can get a 1% share of people shipping products and light boxes. We all get too many cardboard boxes. So we designed this first to be a continental mix. Some of the seeds actually come from uh, Norway. We make these ecologically and target specific, so we'll have target specific mixes in the boxes to the destinations uh, to which they are sent. And so here is two of my employees' kids. Her name is Sequoia. And he is cedar, there's a sequoia, and there's a cedar. <laughs> and so, from life boxes, these actually the trees came from the life boxes. And so here is my mother, and uh, who's now tumor free. He's uh, my daughter, and my grandson. And we go out, and our deciduous forest, a climaxes, so we put the conifer trees underneath the deciduous trees. And it's a shovel-ready solution to climate change. So we came up with a family tree program. This is the way I think I can have the most dramatic impact for the positive in the shortest amount of time. And so we've designed now apps for the iPhone and the iPad. And you go to the app here, and you go to our Lightbox homepage. You can then register the coordinates of where your trees have been planted on Google Earth. You can register your name, your longitude, latitude. You can name the trees. You can be part of the family tree program with your relatives. Competitions between schools, competitions between universities, between countries. And then you register on our homepage's coordinates. And as GPS, uh, as satellite imaging, they confirm the trees are there and confirm the carbon has been sequestered. 
This democratizes the carbon credit economy, which is right now being uh, monopolized, unfortunately, by the carbon credit uh, people who claim they have 100 hectares or more. They don't recognize individual contributions. Whole Foods gave us the Green Packaging Award, and now we've shipped out about 4 million tree seeds in the past two months as our efforts through our business, you know, shipping out boxes and life boxes. And I hope that someday that our descendants, you know, mine and yours, will be friends walking through the old growth forest from the life boxes. I want to thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, I 